My name is Rosemary Morgan. I'm on faculty here at the School of Public Health in the Department of International Health in the Health Systems Program. I am a gender specialist and work on many different gender and health health systems projects. Uh, the, the title of the event today is Gender in Humanitarian Health, and I will be introducing all of our speakers in just a moment. But before I do, this, this event is being co-sponsored by two centers at the school. The first, the Johns Hopkins Center for Humanitarian Health which serves as a leading interdisciplinary center focused on improving global public health preparedness and response in humanitarian crises. The center brings together ex experts from diverse fields with the aim of mitigating health disparities in conflict zones, natural disasters, and other emergencies. It focuses on teaching, research, and evidence-based advocacy in humanitarian health. And Dr. Paul Spiegel, he is the director of the center, is here with me today and co-moderating the session. And you will hear from Dr. Spiegel a little bit later on. The event is also co-sponsored by our brand new Center for Global Women's Health and Gender Equity here at Johns Hopkins. Uh, we are just launching this center and we have a launch event on October 18th. This is an in-person event and information will be shared broadly with everybody. Um, and it will be here from four to 5.30 in Finestone Hall. And we're also currently developing our online presence. So watch this space. You can follow the center on Twitter. Um, this, we have this event today and also an event tomorrow on adolescence, gender beliefs in India, does mother's empowerment matter? So we're very delighted to be able to co-sponsor this event today. Then without further ado, let me get to our speakers. Um, I should first start by saying that one of our speakers, um, Zolfi, unfortunately had to give his apologies. Um, something something uh, more urgent or more urgent came up this week and wasn't and he wasn't able to join us. Um, but we have three excellent speakers uh, for for you today. So we have. Dr. Valerie Percival, who is an associate professor and the associate director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University in Canada. And Valerie is joining us virtually today. So Valerie Percival um, is also, she's also a fellow at the Wilson Center and her research focuses on the interrelationships among health, gender and peace and violence. She is the commissioner for the Lancet Commission on Peaceful Societies through Health Equity and Gender Equality and has led on the research and writing of the, uh, of the commission report, which you will be hearing about today. So we're delighted to be able to hold this event about the, the to, to celebrate the launch of this report, which, which Val really spearheaded and led on and we'll share more details about. We also have Dr. Catherine Falb, who's an assistant professor at the Center for Humanitarian Health in the Department of International Health. Uh, so she, uh, she, she's also a socio-epidemiologist and her research focuses on qualitative and quantitative approaches to collaboratively design, test and scale violence against women and children prevention and response programs in humanitarian settings. She has spent 10 years with the International Rescue Committee and most recently served as research director where she oversaw a multidisciplinary humanitarian research team. And Dr. Falb is joining us in person today. We also have uh, Karen Grohn, who is also in person and joining us, came all the way from DC, which is no, it's not that far, but it's no small feat with the traffic. So we really appreciate mm -hmm. Karen, you joining us today. Um, Karen is a senior fellow at the, the Center for Sustainable Development at the Brookings Institute. She lead, where she leads a program on gender equality and sustainable development. And over the course of her career, she has served as global director for gender at the World Bank Group and held positions at the US Agency for International Development, American University, the Levy Economics Institute at Bard College and the International Center for Research on Women. She has published widely on fiscal policy, trade development and health. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. So without further ado, we're going to start off with um, Valerie presenting and then hand it over to Karen. And then Kate is going to come in and present and provide some reflections. And then we'll be opening it up 
to question and questions from the audience, both in person and online. So those that are online, please do use the Q&A box to input your questions and we will review those and, and then ask them for you. Please do, if you're online, state your name and where you're from and we can include that in your, in your question as well. So Val, over to you. And please just say next slide when you're ready to, to move on. Yeah, thanks so much, Rosemary. And I apologize for not being with you in person today, but I'm very happy to join you virtually to uh, present an overview of the report of the Lancet Commission on Peaceful Societies Through Health Equity and Gender Equality. So this report brings together the work of many people and has benefited from the support of several organizations who are listed here on the slide. Um, I'd also like to just extend a special thanks to Rosemary and to Paul uh, for their efforts in hosting this event uh, and also for all the work that you do uh, to advance health equity and gender equality through your work. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in today's, uh, over the next 10 to 15 minutes in this presentation, I will try and situate the report in the current global context. I quickly review the key findings of the report and discuss its relevance for the humanitarian community. Next slide, please. So this is no surprise to any of you. We're living in very troubled times. Uh, an increasingly dangerous and unpredictable world seems to lie ahead of us, and one in which there are more diagnosis of the problems than identification of potential solutions. So communities and policymakers are struggling to respond to multiple and overlapping crises, which range from social and economic consequences of the pandemic to the impacts of climate change, food insecurity, natural disasters, and rising violence. So complexity scientists call these overlapping and interacting challenges a polycrisis. And in our interconnected world, the entanglement of these various crises makes their resolutions much more difficult. So we use the framing of the polycrisis within a report uh, to illustrate how improvements to gender equality and health equity can provide a feasible and practical pathway out of what we term harmful cycles of violence and inequity and into beneficial cycles of peace. Next slide, please. So again, uh, just to illustrate um, the, our troubled times, this uh, graph was provided to us by the Uppsala Conflict Data Program, and it illustrates the dramatic increase in violence, organized violence, which includes three subtypes, state-based violence, non-state conflict, and one-sided violence against civilian populations. So you'll see in, in uh, 2022, last year, we saw a, a rapid sp spike in, in that violence uh, driven by conflicts in Ukraine as well as Ethiopia. And we don't really see any sign of this violence ebbing. Next slide, please. Um, so what were the objectives of the commission? So we were launched in 2019 and we were tasked with understanding the interrelationships among three SDGs. So the SDG on health, uh, the SDG on gender equality and the SDG related to peace. So our specific research question was, can improved health equity and gender equality contribute to more peaceful societies? And if so, how? And while the world's changed significantly over the course of the commission's work, our objectives and goals did not. We really wanted to bring together a diverse uh, group of people representing different disciplines to examine this question. We wanted to establish an empirical foundation for these relationships to help guide future inquiry. And we also wanted to contribute to national and global policy development, including the SDG agenda. So we deliberately decided to undertake this very broad and, and perhaps overly ambitious approach to this question, because we really wanted to establish a conceptual framework for how to understand the relationships among health, gender, and violence that future research could build upon. Next slide, please. So not to give away our, um, our end at the beginning, but our report reaches four conclusions about health equity and gender equality in relation to peaceful societies. So first, we argue that improvement to health equity and gender equality have this unique and powerful ability to contribute to peace. Um, secondly, uh, to, con to unleash the promise of this uh, research agenda, we argue that health equity and gender equality processes must be led from the inside out uh, by communities and tailored to their context. Given this research, we also call on the health sector to embrace, advocate, 
and advance, not just health equity, but also gender equality. And we provide benchmarks for gender equal health responses to help guide that effort. And then finally, we also suggest that health equity and gender equality should be central to national and global processes to build peace building for peace building and, and broader well being. Next slide, please. Um, so before we go any further, I thought I should just be a good academic and define our terms. So health equity we refer to as meaning that everyone, regardless of identity or socioeconomic circumstance, should be able to enjoy universal access to healthcare services and things like essential medicines and vaccines and technologies. Um, and gender equality, we define as meaning that everyone, regardless of gender identity, should be able to develop their human capabilities, access economic and broader public sector resources, live in safety and security, and exercise agency. So to invest, oh, sorry, next slide, please. Um, to investigate our research question and to assess really if and how health equity and gender equality have an independent role in, in the dynamics of conflict and peace was quite a challenging task. We know that health, gender, and conflicts are shaped by their broader social and economic context. Poli uh, political scientists call this the problem of endogeneity. We also know that they interact with each other to influence each other. So how, uh, so to enable us to analyze these complex relationships, we adopted the concept of self-reinforcing cycles. So how we describe these cycles really depends our, on our interpretation of the outcome. So health inequities, gender inequalities, and organized violence um, interact to reinforce each other in harmful cycles. Beneficial cycles are ones in which health equity, gender equality, and peace reinforce each other. And then our theory of change is that improvements in health equity and gender equality under the right conditions can transform self-reinforcing cycles, enabling societies to transition from harmful to beneficial cycles. So we know that in self-reinforcing cycles, a significant shift in the value of one of the variables can prompt the dynamics of the cycle to change. And so I'm sorry for the the, um, the graphics on this, that we have those two center uh, uh, circles that you can't really see, but it says improved health equity and improved gender equality. So basically we're arguing that through those improvements, uh, societies can nudge from harmful to beneficial cycles. Next slide, please. Uh, to determine if these self-reinforcing cycles existed and to explore a theory of change, uh, we use several research methods. So first, to establish the what, uh, do these associations and cycles exist? We used cross-national statistical analysis, statistical modeling of the relationships among indicators of health equity, gender equality, and violence uh, for the past 25 plus years. Um, these statistical models uh, examined three hypotheses. Do harmful cycles exist? Do beneficial cycles exist? And is there evidence to support uh, the transition from harmful to beneficial cycles if health and gender indicators improve? Um, and then to examine the how and the why, as well as the implications for policy, we undertook comprehensive literature reviews and case studies of both countries and processes. Um, so we looked at um, reviews of Afghanistan, Mozambique, Kosovo, as well as efforts of El Salvador and Kenya's health systems to address sexual and gender-based violence. These were really case studies of convenience based on the knowledge of commissioners. Um, future research, as we argue in the report, needs to be based on proper mixed method analyses. Um, in terms of the processes that we reviewed, we looked at pandemic models, the gendered impact of COVID, the role of women in peace processes, trust in health systems, official development assistance for health and conflict recidivism, which is the return to conflict after it's ended, uh, and gender in health and, and humanitarian engagement. Next slide, please. Um, so like all research, this report has several limitations. It was exploratory in nature. We use both quantitative and qualitative approaches. These were prob plausibility probes. They weren't causal models designed to establish this conceptual framework upon which other research uh, could build. We also face data limitations, uh, particularly in terms of our ability to undertake intersectional analysis. And we also acknowledge that the epistemology and training of the researchers uh, on the team really influenced our observation and interpretation of these health, gender, and conflict processes. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of the statistical findings, um, we did uh, find support, uh, extensive support for the existence of harmful cycles, the interaction between health inequities, gender inequalities, and violence. We did find support for the existence of beneficial cycles uh, that gender equality, health equity, and peace reinforce each other um, with a caveat of ceiling effects, which is explained in more detail in the report. And we do find support for our theory of change that statistical associations did show that under the right conditions, improvements in health equity can transform self-reinforcing cycles. And we particularly found support for health equity in nudging, uh, improvements in health equity in nudging societies out of uh, harmful cycles, but also the importance of health equity and gender equality in sustaining those beneficial cycles. And one of the things that I think would be helpful for future research is to undertake mis like a proper mixed methods approach where you look at these broader statistical models and then undertake uh, more detailed case studies within specific countries to look at these relationships in more detail. Next slide, please. Um, to help build this conceptual framework for how and why um, these, um, these associations exist, um, we argue that improvements to health equity and gender equality are really catalytic. Over the long term, they transform society. So they transform the way we see each other, individual agency and capabilities, and they challenge and shift power within society. So we applied the Catherine Sickink and Thomas Reese framework on the adaptation of human rights norms. So uh, we show that health equity and gender equality are realized by slowly working towards a social consensus or taken for granted status of the importance of principles of health equity and gender equality. Um, but to realize these principles, you really need tangible actions. So what we call mechanisms in the report. Um, these mechanisms include advocacy uh, and the institutionalization of gender equality and health equity into formal systems. So for health equity, you obviously need to establish laws that recognize rights, provide health services and systems, and safeguard other determinants of health. Gender equality is institutionalized again through laws, but also through ensuring access to education, the ability of everyone to engage in a meaningful way in the economy, access to technology, infrastructure, and the ability to participate in civic life and politics. So while these, we recognize these processes are extremely contentious and very challenging, through them, capabilities are transformed which catalyzes economic, social, and political changes in society. So economic changes include increased human capital uh, and more inclusive economic growth. Social effects also include social capital, improved social capital, particularly bridging social capital, which is the links between different groups in the society, and linking social capital, which is the, the relationship between civil society groups and the government, and transform social norms. And there, we also show that there are political effects, so an improved uh, social contract uh, between uh, the government and its population, improved levels of trust, and enhanced quality of governance. And particularly for gender equality, the relationship between improved gender uh, quality of governance is quite clear. Next slide, please. Um, this report, in terms of its implications for the health sector, it furthers the work of the Lancet Gender Norms in Health series, which Rosemary was involved in, to examine the health, how the health sector perpetuates gender inequalities. So we looked at the gender blind nature of COVID-19 responses. We examined how the failure of the health sector, including the humanitarian sector, to fully embrace gender equality has led to the tolerance of sexual exploitation and abuse. And we outlined the reluctance of women and sexual and gender minorities to access health services given their experiences of discrimination and abuse in the, servants, in the services that they receive. So we know, however, that the health sector can also be an important force for change. We review research that documents the important role of community health workers in advancing both health equity and gender equality within their communities. And we use this as a base to argue that the health sector has the ability and more importantly, the responsibility to promote gender equality. So to guide the health sector in its role, we outline benchmarks for what we call gender equal health responses. 
Um, as a result of these studies and in the context of the broader report, we argue that the humanitarian sector also must embrace its responsibility to promote, oh, sorry, next slide, please, Rosemary, um, that the, the um, humanitarian sector must also embrace its responsibility to promote gender equality. Uh, we suggest a definition for uh, gender equal humanitarian action and argue that the humanitarian sector must extend the principle of humanity to include gender equality embrace its responsibility to advance gender equality outcomes in the health services that they that they're delivering but also within other services humanitarian services and must really truly confront abuses of power within humanitarian settings next slide please so one of the observations about gender and particularly gender based analysis that is reflected in the report and i think karen might speak to this in in her presentation as well is that gender-based analysis can be really complex, even for gender experts. And so from a practical perspective, particularly given the realities of humanitarian contexts, the resource and time constraints, and the overwhelming demands uh, on everyone, uh, we have busy people who are not gender experts who need to be able to quickly understand and implement what we mean by gender equal humanitarian action. So we adopted a benchmarking approach uh, and in panel 15 in the report, we outline what uh, benchmarks for gender equal humanitarian action in governance and leadership and financing health information, human resources and health services. And this is just suggestive. It's just an effort to start the conversation on these gender equal benchmarks. And obviously people that are working in humanitarian in the humanitarian sector can refine and contradict and further them. So next slide, please. Um, and then finally, the report advocates uh, for gender equality and health equity to be prioritized in all policy agendas, and particularly those in health, fragile and conflict affected settings, humanitarian agendas. And we know that a promising foundation of norms, institutions, and funding mechanisms exists upon which policy initiatives can build. But any policy initiatives from the community to the global level must learn from the mistakes of the past. So we outline um, several of those missteps, which include that health equity and gender equality cannot be instrumentalized for the political security or foreign policy objectives of external actors. We must also avoid what we call imitation projects where we copy institutional structures, uh, interventions that have worked in other settings and hope that they'll work in a completely different social, economic and, and cultural context. And efforts to promote gender equality must avoid what we call the superheroine fallacy, where women are promoted as leaders and as agents of transformation without really sufficient efforts to address the structural conditions that enable broader gender equality within the society. And we also illustrate the importance of emerging opportunities such as digital technologies and the power of data as we implement these policy agendas. Next slide, please. So if you want, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I stayed within my 15 minutes. Um, for further information and copies of the report, you can either um, uh, look at the Commission website and the Lancet also has a, a dedicated website for the Commission's report. So thank you very much and I look forward to any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Val. And, and those online, if you do have questions, please make sure to input them into the Q&A box and we will have a, a set, set uh, allocated time at the end of the talks for questions. It's now my pleasure to invite to the podium uh, Karen Grohn, uh, who led on one of the case studies in the report. So really, uh, really excited to hear, hear from you. And then everything is set up. You can just use, you can use the, the arrow button to move the slides. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me, Rosemary and Paul and uh, uh, Val and Makiba and everybody who organized this. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as Rosemary mentioned and as Val said, I was privileged to write one of the background papers for the commission report with Gita Ralgupta, who is known maybe to some of you. Um, our paper actually builds on work that we produced actually for the Lancet series on gender norms and health, where we uh, uh, were talking about what can be done better in the health sector. And we decided to take some of those ideas and think about them in the context of the humanitarian um, sector. Um, we, uh, so I, I'm gonna uh, say some things straight out and 
hope that I can provoke some conversation about this. Um, uh, I've been working on, on quote unquote gender uh, for a lot of my career now. I'm actually an economist by training, uh, but I've had a lot of um, uh, positions in policy institutions in the UN, in the US government, with the World Bank. And I have to say, I really dislike the words gender and I really have a strong distaste for the main approach to thinking about how institutions can achieve equality between males and females and help to set the enabling conditions for women to become empowered. And that approach is called mainstreaming and I'm not a fan. So I'm gonna um, talk a little bit about those issues in this paper. Why don't I like gender? Because whether we like it or not, people revert to women. It's just kind of uh, in an unconscious bias at this, po at this point in, um, in people's thought process. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in the humanitarian sector. Gender is, in our view, is not that. It's the normative context. It's the relationships between males and females and the ways in which norms are embedded in our individual psyches, they get embedded in the way institutions work and the rules of the game. They're embedded in markets, they're embedded in social structures. And it's very hard for development practitioners, whether in the humanitarian space or the development space to really tackle the ways um, in which these norms are embedded and become structural and systemic. So the focus becomes on women and sometimes women versus men, but without really this deeper, deeper approach. So um, what did we do in our paper, uh, which was um, published actually uh, last June in the Journal of in International Humanitarian Action. And the paper is called um, Beyond Gender Mainstreaming, Transforming Humanitarian Action Organizations and Culture. So uh, we had, uh, there were four, auth five authors, um, along with Gita Ragupta, we had Rina Gupta, we had uh, Sarah Feuer, who was with the commission, and Sia Nowerji, who is with the UN Foundation. And we undertook a qualitative analysis assessing how the humanitarian's uh, response to conflicts, to natural disasters, but mostly conflicts, but the, there's an overlap with the natural disaster literature, addresses differences and inequalities between uh, men and women in three domains, capabilities, which is in um, the ability to thrive, to be healthy, so that's education and health sectors, uh, opportunities, largely economic and political, uh, safety, and then agency, the ability uh, to, um, to, to facilitate, to take active and meaningful participation in decision-making uh, in all, all levels. Um, we did extensive analysis of humanitarian program cycle documents, uh, several sets of documents, what are called humanitarian needs overviews, humanitarian response plans, humanitarian annual reports, and humanitarian appeals for eight countries representative of um, re regions where there are conflicts. So Afghanistan and Bangladesh, Yemen and Syria, South Sudan and Nigeria, Northern Nigeria, and Colombia and Venezuela. And I think we must have reviewed, um, I was gonna say more than 400 documents, which was a huge amount of work to do. Um, we did interviews with uh, a snowball sample of 44 individuals from 15 organizations, which are the biggest actors in the humanitarian sector. And then we did a range of interviews with um, independent uh, experts uh, on issues about leadership commitment, the way in which they saw policy and strategy, their staffing structure, um, their funding, uh, training and tools, organizational incentives, and monitoring mechanisms. So we went through extensively all of these documents for each of these um, issue areas. And we reviewed all sectors in humanitarian uh, programming. I have to say our guidebook, I don't know how many of you know, the Inter IASC, the International, tell me. Uh, Your agency standing. In, thank you, the interagency. I should know this by heart. Um, which is extensive and is sort of the Bible for uh, a lot of people who work uh, in the space and, and all of their related documents. Uh, so we, we looked at a number of UN agencies, including OCHA, UNHCR, UNIF UNICEF, the World Food Program, and WHO, a number of bilateral donors, uh, uh, including Global Affairs Canada, CETA, Swedish CETA and USAID, 
several of the uh, multilateral development banks. In, uh, we did look at the World Bank. It's not on this list because um, it wasn't as extensive as um, ADB and EBRD. And then a number of the NGOs, uh, including the International Federation of the Red Cross and I International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC and, and, and IRC. Um, and we had a number of interesting findings. Now, uh, the bulk of the paper is on findings and I don't have time to present them to you. So um, we found two sets of findings. Uh, one was to, what I previewed earlier that gender mainstreaming is really a flawed approach. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the issues and then uh, talking about specifically the culture of the humanitarian sector and the behavior of the actors in humanitarian organizations. So um, why is gender mainstreaming um, a flawed approach? Uh, well, we found first of all that there's a gap between uh, intention and implementation. A lot of the documents are really great on intention. Um, we're gonna reduce inequalities between men and women. We're gonna pay attention to cultural context. We're gonna understand the ways in which gender norms play out. But then when you get, to, uh, then it gets lost in every single part of the, um, the rest of the cycle. So um, ideally the, um, uh, so it gets lost in the implementation plans. It gets lost in the financing. And there's bare mention, if we're lucky, in terms of monit monitoring and accountability reports. And, and there should be a logical chain across the cycle, but we rarely uh, found it. Um, and there is inconsistent quality. The, the guidelines uh, call for uh, disaggregation of data by age and by sex. We, we call that sad sex, sex disaggregated um, data by uh, age and, and sex, but uh, very inconsistent. And actually it's not a problem that's um, only um, part of the humanitarian system, but we have huge missing gender data gaps uh, more generally in a lot of domains, including in the economic domain, uh, including with respect to GBV, which Nancy knows, but which are starting to be filled in some ways, lots of gender data gaps um, uh, uh, on norms. Uh, and we have much better data on education and health, but there's still uh, gender data gaps uh, there. Um, so uh, the quality of the data is inconsistent and patching. And there's varied reporting. And let me give you one example from the uh, IASC uh, handbook in the health section, which is very uh, probably appropriate for you. They, the health section guidance of this report is both very specific in some ways in terms of what it tells you to do, and then very generic in other ways. So for instance, it calls for sex and age disaggregated data but then it's very light on what sex and age disaggregated data and how you might collect it and how you might analyze it and, uh, 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 and how it can inform um, decision-making. Um, it talks also about barriers to access for health services and so forth. And um, this section, um, this handbook is over 400 pages long. And when you talk to practitioners in the field, they're not going to, who are in emergency situations, they're not going to read 400, paper, uh, 400 pages. So all, of they, all they want is five things that they're supposed to do. Just tell me what to do and how to do it, and I will follow it. But I am not going to read through 400 pages. And I have to say that um, I think this is something, when you think about mainstreaming overall, this is a flaw of mainstreaming. It's very long on process and very short on specifics and on, on, on house of things. Um, I mentioned the lack of linkage between documents across the humanitarian um, cycle. Um, the H, uh, uh, NOs are supposed to be useful to inform HCPs, and those are supposed to feed into the HAR reports, uh, and you rarely find the con connection. So in uh, you might find the needs assessment that has more commonly addressed women and girls' needs less so men and boys needs, which if you're doing gender, you'd really actually do a disaggregated approach to both. To, uh, and, and there's very little, by the way, on intersectionality. So I really, um, on the gender continuum. So I, I'm, I'm not focusing on uh, more than the binary uh, in terms of males and females, but even there it's, it's, um, 
there are a lot of limitations. So you, you can see the needs, but then the needs may not be addressed. And then there's, as I mentioned, no report on, on, uh, in the monitoring. There's a, a focus on process, particularly on training. Uh, and there's, uh, with very few results, what's the outcome that you want to achieve? Do you want an outcome in terms of equal access to health services? Do you want to have an outcome like women's representation, women have equal representation on a refugee camp uh, committee? Do you want to have an outcome in terms of women have the ability compared to men to have productive livelihoods opportunities, for instance, in refugee settings? Um, basic needs, uh, sorry, there's a conceptual confusion. And this is, I, I mentioned I dislike the word gender. There's a plethora of terms gender transformative, gender sensitive, gender responsive, gender intentional, gender blah, 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 blah. And uh, people generally just don't really know what they mean. You know, that Val was great in actually articulating a definition, but what we wanna do is get beyond that. We wanna get beyond that to a specific result. We want a gap between men and women that we wanna see closed. We wanna define more specifically the nature of the problem, and we wanna identify solutions for um, how to get there. So I'm gonna come back to this in a few minutes. Um, basic needs in the humanitarian sector for very good reasons, uh, very good reasons is prioritized um, over other things. And protection has recently become important, protection in the sense of protection against violence, including gender-based violence. Uh, uh, and participation, just uh, having the numbers of women uh, in um, councils, for instance, are certainly prioritized over gender-based violence and economic opportunities, and more specifically, um, agency, meaning the ability of women themselves collectively or individually um, to have control over their lives. Um, there are in inadequate resources, um, both inconsistent technical resources, that's across all of these organizations, as well as sectors, whether it's education, health, um, peace building, uh, livelihoods, so forth. Uh, gender expertise is inadequate in a few ways. It's not just the number of quote unquote gender experts, but the training. Gender experts tend to be generic as opposed to really steeped in technical issues, whether it's in the water sector or whether it's in, there's more expertise in the health sector, but in the economic sector. And I and that's something that we'll come back to. And finally, there's insufficient um, technical, um, insufficient financial resources. And I wanted to give you an example uh, from our paper that we, we pulled out with respect to gender-based violence. So, um, in our analysis of program documents, even when gender-based violence was included within the protection sector as an ask, and uh, and people wanted money for it, it wasn't resourced appropriately. Uh, three of the eight country appeals that we looked at from Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Syria actually requested funds to address uh, GBV programming, and that was in 2020 but the funds that they received ranged from 16% of the ask mm -hmm. to less than half of the request. And for the other five countries, there's no separate budget item for GBV funding. So it was either not funded or somehow given some crumbs from an overall uh, budget. Um, and, and this was a, pro a problem. There's other issues with um, funding as well, particularly in terms of the localization agenda and money going to local organizations that wanna work on gender equality. So I'm gonna stop with the flaws. I could go uh, on, uh, on the mainstreaming approach because I've written about this for many years now. And I wanted to talk a little bit about humanitarian culture and, and behavior, which is also a behavior, uh, which is also a barrier uh, to change. One of the things um, that I think is really um, important is the culture, and there's now many articles on this, uh, is seen to be a savior mentality and a macho culture. And the savior mentality is important because people are motivated by the desire to save lives and to protect innocent civilians, men, women, children. Uh, but the savior mentality has a negative aspect to it in terms of what it means in terms of a macho cowboy culture. And this macho cowboy culture 
Val referred to this in her report, has led to a tolerance of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. And the sector was exposed, as you all may recall, from um, a scandal at Oxfam, which is one of the humanitarian actors several years ago. Um, I was involved in, in this in real time with the World Bank, actually, in, um, in a, a, a lending operation that the bank had in Northern Uganda. So it was an insecure environment, but it was in the transport sector. The bank did um, uh, uh, suspend the loan, but it, the whole sector was open to self-reflection and to change. And it led to a plethora of new actions in terms of sexual exploitation, harassment, and violent, violence guidelines for workers in the sector, sanctions of workers. But these things haven't fully taken root yet. And we still continue to hear examples uh, of uh, sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, the short, there's also, you can't see it from uh, here, but there's a third issue, which is the short-termism nature of the sector. Humanitarian response is supposed to be short-term. It's not cut out to be longer-term, even though there's been a movement to actually um, address the overlap between humanitarian and development. And there is a movement uh, and, a, and a growing overlap, because if you look in several countries which have been uh, affl afflicted by uh, fragility and violence over years. Sometimes um, in countries like Ethiopia or in, in other elsewhere, refugee camps, people are in refugee camps for 25, 30 years. So we're already in a development situation. It's no longer a short-term humanitarian response. Um, and that affects the principles of programming and affects what uh, actors actually uh, do. Um, the short-termism, um, it means high levels of stress, and that actually, ha uh, and that can impair decision making. Uh, and it can get to burnout. So there's high turnover uh, in the sector, um, and uh, that short termism is incongruent with social norms change, which is what's really, really um, essential. And that because social norms is longer term, uh, longer term programming. Um, so what do we advocate for? Well, the first is we, we think it's important to move beyond gender mainstreaming towards a results-focused approach. Um, how do you do that? Well, get rid of the jargon of gender to be much more explicit about the issues that need to be targeted. The IASC handbook and a lot of those guidance documents could be scrubbed and, and uh, replaced with much more specific um, problem targets and statements. Um, in addition to the investments in basic needs, uh, making more robust invest investment in two key areas, which is preventing and responding to gender-based violence and increasing women's economic and decision-making opportunities. We have some examples of that where we think it's really, really important. Um, and I think probably one of the most important things, and this is from a little bit moving to the behavioral science side, which is what I wanna turn to next, use every opportunity to break out of gender stereotypical programming, which sees women solely in their roles as mothers and caretakers and not as economic actors or peacemakers or peace builders and sees men as providers. Um, yeah, so I'm going to wrap up in a minute. Um, uh, but there's lots that could be done, whether they're in refugee camps or displaced person camps or, or in humanitarian programming. The number of basket weaving and sewing and handicraft projects that you see in the sector is just not gonna uh, transform norms and roles or help women's economic uh, roles as actors. So what can we do? Um, I think there's a research agenda emerging to um, invest in developing behavioral science approaches in terms of, um, of nudges and organizational uh, incentives and, and rule building. Um, and our paper goes into some detail uh, about what those can be, for instance, developing an app for every humanitarian worker's mobile phone that lists the four priority actions uh, for each sector of the IASC handbook. That is something that would be very pragmatic. Um, there's things that are still inconsistent um, in refugee camps. 
starting off with providing identity documents to women and girls. Many women don't who um, are displaced don't have access to identification cards. Um, and then trying to figure out the interoperability between those identification cards, things um, which is becoming much more digital, and then things like digital cash transfers and digital, um, digital approaches for education and so forth. There's many things that we can do um, with technology. Adopting a learning by doing approach, which um, has not very much characterized um, the sector, I think the most important piece, and I'm going to end with this, is to address the cognitive and motivational biases in decision making. Mainstreaming is about the technical things that people do, and it appeals to the mind, but we need to appeal to the heart. And humanitarians are motivated by the heart, by their passion for doing well and doing good. So we can take advantage of the motivation here to show how by doing these other practical things, some of which I've listed um, in the previous slide, you can show how you can be more successful. And once you start to see some things that are effective and working, there's that old adage, success begets success. And I think that's something um, to build upon. So I'm gonna stop there and not go through the rest of my time. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karen. And uh really liked how you identified some of the key challenges and then also like solutions and what really specific solutions of how we might be able to address it. Um, as a gender specialist, I absolutely agree with you on the gender jargon and, and confusion around terminology and then how that equates to the lack of sort of skills in that area. So I'm going to take this opportunity as moderator to plug that we're trying to address here with our newly launched Gender and Health Summer Institute. Uh, where, where that happens between June and August, where we really have short courses on very applied gender skills for the very reasons that you you discussed. Um, so it's now my pleasure to invite Kate Falb up to the up to the podium. So the floor is yours. You are, and you can just. Um, righty. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so honored to be here today and speak after. Val and Karen on their great presentations. Um, the focus of my presentation today is to is grounded within the conceptual theory of change that the Lancet Commission had presented and really focus on that arrow of specific interventions and approaches that we can use to move from these harmful cycles of health inequity, gender inequality, and organized violence, and use these moments of disruption and fracture to actually advance social justice and gender equality. Um, and so by the end of this presentation, I hope you'll also agree with me, it's actually possible to advance gender equality, even in times of crises, and we should continue investment in these areas. So double clicking within that arrow that I had highlighted, I had mapped out some different approaches moving from minimum standards, which were some of the things that Karen had just mentioned in terms of zero tolerance, the importance of disaggregated data, all the way through transformational changes. And I'll use this as a bit of a roadmap just to walk through some specific examples. Um, so our first port of call is gonna be around the promotion of equality and equity, which I had specifically named as such because I knew I was following this presentation around gender mainstreaming uh, criticism. So I've changed this outcome and I uh, wanted to talk about a specific example around how cash transfer programming in humanitarian emergencies can be transformed and designed better to meet the needs of women and girls. And so this is a theory of change of some work that we had done in Rafa Governance Syria, where we had done a mixed method study to examine the potential influence of cash on the experiences of women. And we know cash is just proliferating in humanitarian emergencies. It's a great vehicle to reach a wide variety of people in very short time in a very effective and efficient manner to help them meet their basic household needs. But we also know that when you inject cash into a household, there can be a proliferation of effects and influences within the home, including potential changes in negative coping strategies, uh, different dynamics in decision-making for women and couples, and even eventually thinking about, does this actually change different forms of economic abuse or experiences of intimate partner violence for women in these settings? And so through this study, um, again, just a, a mixed methods approach, but we found that you know cash was highly effective in meeting basic needs, hugely accepted by women, but also there were some instances around economic abuse and stories around how we can just design programming better to help them meet their needs and not exacerbate any harm. 
steps. And so some of that work led to another project um, called Safer Cash, where we actually said, how can we just better design cash programming that's delivered by a range of humanitarian organizations to better meet outcomes for women and girls, and of course, other diverse populations, whether it's older persons, people with disabilities, et cetera. And so through this work, we did a qualitative study in Cameroon and Afghanistan, where we looked at some principles around prioritizing safety and dignity and avoiding causing harm within cash programming. How can we ensure meaningful access across a range of different identities that have just different access barriers and opportunities and promote accountability and participation and empowerment? And the result of this work was piloted in Afghanistan, but it was a safer cash toolkit where we had three very specific short tools that were to be combined with um, the program program development cycle that cash actors are already doing, where we can be asking these different questions where they can very easily tailor their models and just do a better job with as light a lift as possible for people who are non-gender experts. So that's just one example how we can move the needle a little bit on more of that uh, program that's not gender mainstreaming, but working towards equal outcomes. Um, and then our next stop that I'll talk about towards transformational change towards gender equality is around specific programming that's actually designed to achieve gender equality and also uh, promote the prevention and response to violence against women and girls in conflict. And so within this body of work, we know that multiple strategies are needed across the ecological model to support women and girls. And this really starts at the core of that model and all of the work that we do in the violence against women field in that we need to center survivors in those responses and ensuring that we have strong case management processes where women do have that documentation that they need. They can access justice, seek health services where they need it. And then also combine that with um, more supplemental mental health and psychosocial support, such as cognitive behavioral therapy approaches that have been tested in Eastern DRC. Moving beyond that core work of centering the survivor, there's interpersonal strategies that combine a range of economic and social uh, empowerment strategies from livelihoods work to village savings and loans associations, land rights for women and life skills programs for adolescent girls. Moving beyond that interpersonal level is the family level. And I'll talk in just a moment about a safe at home program that we had developed just to give a little bit more flavor to what that could look like. And then obviously expanding outwards, we have the community, which is engaging men and boys in work. And then finally that societal norm change. I do wanna make one caveat to this slide is that yes, we do need multiple strategies. The evidence behind each of these is still mixed in different ways. The asterisk that you'll see is where we have strong studies that are demonstrating effectiveness and impact. The others, I think we need to still work on um, changing things, pivoting where other things are not working and really driving just better decision-making. So a lot of work within all of these different spaces. Um, but again, just as an example of a family-based level approach, this the Safe at Home program was developed in, and tested in uh, Eastern DRC, and it's a whole of family approach to reduce violence against women and children. And it combines um, women's discussion groups going on along with men's discussion groups, and then families are coming together with their children as well as couples separately to talk about different issues of power, of parenting skills, of trauma-informed care within humanitarian settings, all these different factors. And I just pulled out one specific outcome of this uh, trial that we had implemented, but we do see significant reductions in past three-month intimate partner violence from baseline to endline in the intervention arm for safe at home participants. And so there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this type of work is possible and it is effective. Again, I'll criticize my own work and say, when I talk through this, this is a four to six month intensive, intensive program. It also requires a protracted emergency to be delivering people and have that long-term engagement with folks. And so I think just a future direction for this work, again, is looking at acute settings and how can we offer more bespoke packages to populations that are on the move who might engage through tech platforms or, or different ways that we can still be giving these messages, but in different types of um, dosage and cadence and just meeting people where they're at in different types of humanitarian crisis. Um, so the final stop towards achieving gender equality is around transformational change. And uh, the, the previous presentations also discussed this, but I just wanted to underscore how absolutely important this is. 
Um, the first is supporting women's rights organizations in humanitarian settings, not in just leadership and decision making, but also in funding and looking at our funding models across the humanitarian setting um, and thinking about how we can further invest in core support for these organizations, how we can reduce barriers for applying for funds and as well as the reporting behind different grants that they might be receiving, as well as right-sizing the level of investment in the organizations. They're small, and of course they've been there before during after conflicts, but they also might not be able to take a huge influx of a $5 million investment. So thinking about how can we actually structure funding to support long-term um, support and success of these organizations. The second piece, um, going back to Karen's points around ensuring safe and supportive workplaces for women and others with diverse social identities within humanitarian organizations is critically important for their own success as well as delivering higher quality program for populations that we're serving. And then finally, thinking about investment in systems strengthening, not just on the health side of the house, but what are the systems for gender equality and social work and all these other pieces that need to be further um, investigated and, and funded alongside thinking about different scale and sustainability for gender equality throughout all of these arcs of crises. So that is my quick talk. And hopefully with all of that, you will agree, we can actually achieve this with the right investment. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going to invite Dr. Paul Spiegel to come up and moderate the question and answer. <coughs> I think we will do this and maybe put Val over there so she's not so big in the room <laughs> for what we're, we're watching out for you. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone. And um, very, very interesting. I, I'm going to, while we're, while we're waiting um, for, there's some comments online, and I'd like to have some questions for you. I just want to start with uh, one broad question for each of you. And I'm actually going to think more back when I was with UNHCR and then some recent, um, when I was in the field, both in Afghanistan and then in Ukraine. And the question is, how do you, we talk about jargon, we talk about, um, there are a lot of concepts, some are are more cerebral, and then some are, when you're in the field, kind of what you said, you really don't have time to, to do everything, and you need to be able to just either be told or pretty close to be said, please do this, this, and this, and we will do it. Um, so one question is, how do you, how do you try to, um, target your messages at different areas. When I was at UNHCR, we did the, the various interagency standing committee documentation, documents. You are constantly, um, it's, it's a document by numerous people and you're constantly compromising. So you just can't really say what you want to say often because you have all these different organizations involved. So one question is, is that, is how would you go about um, trying to get messages to different, uh, different groups and then secondly, um, when I was in Ukraine and then recently in or Afghanistan and then Ukraine, the perceptions of gender and their, their thinking, the cultural aspects are very, very different. How do you address those? Those are difficult questions, I realize, but it would be great to, to hear. And maybe Val, we can start with you online. Yeah, thanks for those really easy questions, Paul. <laughs> um, on the second one, the perceptions of gender, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I had a conversation with a colleague about Canada's feminist international assistance policy and whether it's still alive or dead and how do we support gender equality, particularly given the backlash that we're seeing. Um, I guess, you know, my uh, answer to that would be that I think we need to focus on the real tangible actions that um, can move the needle on indicators of equality. So things like education, access to infrastructure, access to the economy, um, maybe a little less than 
the rhetoric surrounding, you know, a, a feminist or approach or a gender equality that that comes with a lot of baggage, particularly if external actors are the ones that are delivering those messages. So I, I think maybe just a back to basics approach where we're focusing on tangible, concrete um, measures. Um, and then in terms of how do you get messages across, I think it's challenging for humanitarian actors to deliver these kinds of messages. And I think that the relationship between the humanitarian sector and local civil society organizations um, sometimes isn't as strong as it could be uh, in part because of the, the nature of um, the humanitarian response, the need to be really quick in and out, uh, and in part because that's not one of the, the areas that the humanitarian sector might be strong at, in terms of building those relationships with civil society organizations. So I think that that accountability relationships with, with broader community organizations and uh, would, would be the way to, to deliver those messages. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Um, I, I would definitely agree with your last point, Val, on um, uh, really um, working with local civil society organizations and local groups of women. And unfortunately, the humanitarian sector has had less success in doing that. Um, the development sector hasn't been great either. And I don't know how many of you are following USAID's localization agenda, but it's um, it's not where um, many of us want it, uh, want it to be. So that I think is really important. I wanna give you an example of, um, of uh, from Afghanistan when I was working there. Uh, and when I was at the World Bank, I, I actually had a colleague from an unnamed, uh, who had come to the World Bank from an unnamed, one of the organizations in our sample, so it was one of the uh, INGOs, who actually said to my face, um, if you hadn't championed um, women's rights, uh, uh, you, the donor community in Afghanistan, we wouldn't be where we are today with the Taliban, so that is part of the, pro uh, the problem. And I, I think, you know, I, I was, I didn't know what to say. I was certainly shocked when I heard that comment. Um, but I also felt like it's not, it wasn't him alone. There's probably, it's reflective of a, a lot of people's um, views. And then the question is, what, what do you do? Um, and how do you support women um, to become empowered, to be able to claim their rights in that kind of society? And how do you work with men to help that happen? And uh, I thought back to um, some of the norms change. There, there are norms change interventions that can be delivered. I think um, actually the intervention that you mentioned, Kate, the family approach is really, really important. I, I think working with men is really critical in these societies um, and, we, and it's hard. Um, and it's even harder in a humanitarian context where that cowboy culture is just so prevalent. And by the way, one thing I didn't say, the cowboy culture is also so prevalent among humanitarian organizations because the dominant organizations that they work with in emergencies are militaries. And uh, it is very much a military influenced um, uh, environment. And a lot of the workers in humanitarian organizations come from military uh, institutions. And by the way, just to give you one example from 2020 in terms of the leadership in the humanitarian sector, less than one third of humanitarian coordinators are women. Uh, and the pool, for instance, of people of recruitment is uh, about 70 to 80% men uh, when you look at the data. So it's a hard sector. It's better in the NGO sector, I, in some parts of the NGO sector. Uh, but this is, these are really tough issues. So. Um, I do think it's really um, important to target messages. And I think what we've learned about the norms change is targeting messages about work, things that work for all, not just, it's not one group against another, a zero sum game. It works for men, it works for children, it works for women, uh, it works for society. So figuring out how you talk about that, that certainly is important in terms of the cash transfer uh, space and actually successful cash transfer programs have a component that work with men. Uh, in terms of the benefits for them and their families. Um, there's also some really interesting models in fragile contexts that 
um, uh, where men are, you know, using men as the champions of the messages is another uh, uh, strategy that's really, really important. And particularly using men to stand up um, to other parts of the society. So you need to have organizations like Equamundo and all of those chapters that exist in different places who are also advocating for different visions of masculinity. Thanks. Um, I'll just add on very briefly to those points that I think in terms of the contextual difference, I think it's a fallacy to assume that any program working in DRC can be plopped up and dropped in um, Northeast Nigeria, for example. This needs a lot of care and thought and collaboration with local women's organizations who really have their pulse on the culture and the needs and how to successfully implement a program and not exacerbate harms. And I think that's just a huge piece of it. And I would also say in terms of targeting messages, I think there's different incentives at different levels and money is a big motivator and that donors should be doing a better job around requiring these different um, metrics and successes of organization. Um, we're going to open it up for questions or comments and let's start in uh, here and then um, maybe Rosemary, if you're online and you have some, you can uh, ask that too. Please introduce yourself and I think we probably Hi. Um, oh. yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cynthia Ede. I'm a Nigerian. So I'm from the southern part of Nigeria. So I get why most interventions are in the north, because we have different cultures. And gender inequality is more in the north because of the cultural norms. So I'm just thinking of, well, how have we been taught like interventions targeting norms? Because even if you do cash transfers, the men will still take over. If you decide to target education, the men will still take over and prevent the girls from like benefiting from that. So like, how is it working towards societal norms and engaging men and boys, especially in Nigeria? Thank you. Let's take a couple more just because of time. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm Sienna. Um, I have two questions actually, and they're mostly for Karen. Um, but the first is if you, and you alluded to this a little on uh, your presentation, but whether you think a move towards uh, the triple nexus can dispel or move humanitarian work more away from this macho uh, savior culture and uh, also move away from the short-termism, um, move into more of a development disaster risk reduction um, combination. I'm also wondering um, about your comments about gender transformative programming, whether you see a conflict between implementing gender transformative programming versus meeting people where they are. And this is actually sort of what Cynthia is talking about. So for example, teaching women to repair water pumps is great, but what happens if they have to be accompanied by a makram or a male family member? So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that. Thanks. Do you want to, Rosemary, do you want to read one? Well, sure. We have a, uh, well, first, thanks Val for actually answering a lot of the questions online directly. Um, so we do have a question from Anmar Holmida who asks, what are the practical advice that you can provide for the current local actors and partners on humanitarian and conflict settings to agile their programming with the gender mainstreaming agendas and ensuring gender equality in the different, inter different interventions partners are currently implementing in the sectors um, and with prioritizing the service one. Okay, maybe you can choose accordingly and maybe we'll start, Kate, can we, uh, we'll switch it around. Um, I'll start with Cynthia's question, and I think that's just a really great um, question to be asking around what we can be doing. I think that kind of goes back a little bit to the arrow that I was showing of like, here's a minimum standard when you're doing cash or whatever. Here's just better design programs that people can be implementing. And then moving beyond that, what is actually complementary programming that could then require different resources, different staffing, a different approach totally to that work that will then achieve those outcomes, but doing it in a very thoughtful methodological approach and making sure that it's also aligned to the type of crises that you're in 
so thinking about what can you actually do in early onset is just we're not going to be implementing a complementary program to do gender norms transformation and i think that's just the simple fact of it um but in different crises we can certainly move towards that over the long term I completely agree with that. I think there are different interventions. There's a, a cycle and there's certain things that you're never going to be able to do in the beginning. It's all about protection and, and basic uh, needs, but conflicts these days are protracted and you get into different phases of them. So there are things that you can be doing differently across the different um, phases. One thing I think that's important about cash transfers is, first of all, um, is to in, ensure that they're digital digital transfers have a, a degree of privacy associated with them that a mother-in-law or a spouse cannot get into an account and take the money away. And as if you have a digital transaction system, uh, it gives women more control over how to spend those kinds of things. So um, those, those are, you're shaking your head no, so let's have a discussion about this perhaps <laughs> afterwards. Um, in my experience, that, that's been my experience, but we could talk a little bit more about that. Um, but let me ask, answer um, your question. I, I, I th you know, I want to see that, that nexus between, humanity, you know, to the, the triple nexus that you're talking about grow. And I think if it, we can grow there, can maybe move away um, from the macho of the humanitarian sector per se and from short termism. But you know, it, there's some organizations, humanitarian organizations in this space for whom the longer term, that's not humanitarian work. And so they're some of our leading organizations. So it's very hard. Uh, I don't want to name some names, but it's very, I'm looking, we're smiling at each other. It's really hard because they're, they're very much the leaders of in some of this space. But I think, um, that organization, some of the bigger actors that we had in our sample, like the development banks, which are in the humanitarian space, can start to lay the foundation for the development trajectory, which is really important. And one of my um, challenges when I, I was at the bank for eight years as global director was to try to move the institution to be much more effective in laying that foundation in the kinds of things that it did. But it, it takes a lot of, a lot of work. Um, and the last question I want to just take on very quickly is this conflict between meeting people where they are versus being quote unquote transformational. We had a lot of experience in the DRC, for instance, where we were able to, um, through some of the financing projects that we did in the agriculture sector and in the infrastructure sectors, to really move women into non-traditional roles as tractor drivers, as electricians, as plumbers, as solar, you know, with the solar energy, renewable energy not perfect, you start, you know, you have to grow that kind of space, training younger women uh, in, in the vocational programs, which had only been targeted to men um, in difficult environments, for instance, in, in these Kivu. I, I, uh, and once you start to change the behavior and younger women see women in different roles, it opens up mental um, possibilities and opportunities uh, for what people can do. So I think, um, Yes, we have to meet people where they are, but we also have to show what's possible. And I go back to a study in Afghanistan, actually with um, the charters to see women in leadership uh, because there was a quota for women's participation in the, uh, in the community um, organizations really changed young girls' perception of what they could do. Um, Bell, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. I'm just gonna, I know that we're running out of time. Um, in terms of meeting people where they are, I would agree with Karen that we need to meet people where, we, where they are and we need to give them a reason to move to a, a more kind of gender equal context. And I think that we don't, um, you know, one of the, the projects that we have is a community of practice in Northern Mozambique with the Aga Khan Foundation of Mozambique, where we're trying to develop um, a group of diverse stakeholders in the community um, and 
relate to them the evidence on how gender norms are impacting on the health and well-being of all community members and have them have a conversation about why that matters and what the levers of change are, providing examples of what's worked elsewhere that they can adapt in their context. So this is really what I think if we want um, to focus on that kind of inside out processes, communities need to be in the driver's seat and they also need to know and have access to the research that's being undertaken on them and be able to act upon it. Um, and uh, yeah, and just wanted to highlight that on our website, we had a number of studies that looked at the uh, role of, of men and boys and the impact of sexual violence on men and boys and the response of the lack of response of the humanitarian sector. And some of those uh, studies are on our website. So just to point that out. Thanks. Great. Thank you. I, we are going to, unfortunately, we could continue we on, but we have to stop just because I know there likely is another class or could be another class coming in and many of you have other areas to go. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming. Uh, Karen, Val, and Kate, thank you. Val, congratulations on the commission. Um, it's it's wonderful. This is something very very needed, and it's certainly going to be uh, what we're talking about will be continued. There's so much more to discuss, of course. Um, thank you, Rosemary, and thank you, Makiba, for helping to arrange everything. Um, if you do want to speak to at least two of the speakers, we'll meet you outside if that's okay. So if, in case anyone wants to um, use this room. Thank you again and thanks for everyone online. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? How's your rest of your day? Until tomorrow. There she's coming. Yes, I can. Hi. Are you talking to me? <laughs> I am. Um, just to say Hi. thank you. Oh no, thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks so much for everything that you did to organize this. Thanks, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank Bye. you. Be well, well. Bye. <laughs>